factor. And then my sixth big trend that I think others are going to speak about as well is demographic change. We've got a big demographic shift going on in Africa with both the youth bulge and urbanization. Um, this is thought of as a risk, and it is partly a risk, but it is also an opportunity. We tend to think of demographic change, population growth, in terms of mouths to feed. But with population growth and demographic change come brains to solve problems. Uh, and we always emphasize uh, people are going to eat more and more, uh, put more um, uh, stress on resources, and we forget that it's going to bring more skills, more capacity, uh, and, and everything with it. The history of the world of the last 200 years is a massive increase in population, and with it, a massive increase in human uh, welfare. And so far, the brains have beaten the mouths. I'm not sure that's going to happen going forward. But I say that to be a little provocative, but also to say this is an opportunity. The demographic dividend has, was a gift to Asia. Everybody worried about it. In, in the 1960s, and in fact, it was the engine that provided economic growth because there were the right kinds of policies to provide employment opportunities for people going forward. So that's a big change going forward, uh, which brings me to, so what do we do about the future? I think it's relatively bright for the democracies if we can keep climate change under control, but it's going to depend on big choices that these countries themselves uh, make. Uh, around economics, around diversifying their economies. The countries whose outlook is worst right now are those that are still dependent on a single commodity. Uh, and we know from development experiences over 200 years that one of the keys is to diversify into manufacturing, into industry, into services. It's not easy. It's going to take big investments uh, in infrastructure. It's going to take, as Linda mentioned, in power and in roads. It's going to take big investments in education and health systems. It's going to take uh, big policy changes in the business environment that Tony uh, mentioned earlier in terms of, of creating the way for businesses and entrepreneurs to flourish. Uh, that agenda has started, but it is far from complete. And it's going to take deepening democracy and doing a, even better at holding leaders accountable and having citizen voices being held. If those choices and actions are taken, then I think the future looks uh, fairly, uh, uh, fairly bright. Uh, for us in the United States, uh, I think uh, there's a big onus on us to lead with democracy. Linda talked about how important it is. Countries look to the United States for leadership on democracy. And at the moment, we are far from a shining beacon on how democracy works well. Uh, and, and we need to get our own act together for our own reasons, but also I do worry globally about the shift away from democracy and hearing more and more countries, frankly, looking at some of what happens in the United States and saying, you know what, this, this system of democracy does not work very well. So we're, we need to lead on democracy. We also need to lead on climate change. Part of that is, in, uh, is investing in technologies that are going to help the poorest countries respond. That is, investing in technologies for uh, uh, heat-resistant uh, seed varieties, uh, for drought-resistant seed varieties, investing in desalinization of water and bringing down that cost curve. If we can bring the cost curve down on desalinating water, it, it is a game-changer in many parts of the world. Uh, uh, and obviously, investing in alternative energies. Those investments in technology are going to be huge, and we, along with other countries, are going to have to be in the lead on that. Um, and I think we're going to have to change how we work with the emerging democracies. Again, not everywhere in Africa, but we're going to have to do a much better job of listening, of working in partnership, of not telling them what to do, respecting the fact that they are democratically elected leaders, changing the way that we, uh, that we send our aid money so that it actually helps build their institutions of governance rather than setting up parallel systems where all the money goes through contractors. Uh, I would never do that in Zimbabwe, and I never. I wouldn't do that in Zimbabwe or other poorly governed countries today, but I would do it in the emerging democracies and think of new systems and new ways that we can use our partnership to build those institutions rather than setting up separate institutions. There's much more that we could do, uh, uh, and that'll come out here during the course of the day, but these are some of the uh, top things that come uh, to my mind. I am generally quite optimistic uh, for the future of the sub-Saharan African countries that shift towards democracy. And I'm actually fairly optimistic uh, that, uh, that some of those that haven't yet made that shift will do so in the future, as, as uh, Nigeria did a couple of years ago. But it's going to take us partnering with them. It's going to take us helping those countries that are uh, in fragile situations that are on the cusp of, of, of going forward. It's going to take those courageous decisions at home. 
Um, but if those things happen, then I am uh, fairly optimistic that 20 years from now, we're going to see a larger set of countries that have a larger middle class, that have a more robust democracy, and that are working with us uh, as allies uh, uh, around the world. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention this morning.